There's nothing like our God. And it's good to give a place for people to declare the goodness of God and what has God, what God has done in their lives, and especially on a Thanksgiving Sunday. So we probably still have time to get most of this sermon in. A cruise ship passed by a remote island and all the passengers see a bearded man running around and waving his arms wildly. Captain, one passenger asks, who is that man over there? The captain said, I have no idea, but he goes nuts every year when we pass by here. <laughs> I had another joke, but I'm going to skip that one. Matthew 5, 43 to 44 says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Dear Lord, we have, have a grateful heart because we're allowed to share the word with each other, which a lot of the world, they cannot do that without a threat. But we're grateful, Lord, that we have an opportunity to break the bread of your word. And we just, uh, we just thank you for that today in Jesus' name. I preached about bitterness a couple weeks ago. This is similar. Talking about hatred and hate. Hate and hatred-oriented violence seems to be mainstream lately, at least according to what we see on the news. Wide-eyed, teeth-bared, loud-mouthed, body-shaking people denouncing what they don't know anything about. Taking march and marching orders from who knows where? Loud, sometimes violent demonstrators trying to make their point of view known. There was a bunch of them on the steps of the Democratic National Committee building the other day, and their spokesman said, well, we ha they're not listening to us. So in other words, that means they're not obeying us. <laughs> And they're trying to get Israel to stop their campaign. Now listen to this. This is a woodsism or a woodyism. Love only prevails where love is. Love only prevails where love is. That's a woodyism. I made that up. But it's true. 1 John 4, 19 and 20, we love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have seen. In the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, hatred is described as intense hostility. Is that what you see on a TV when you're looking at these marches? Hostility, usually deriving from fear, anger, or a sense of injury. Another definition is extreme dislike or disgust. Hatred in the Bible. There are a lot of examples of hatred in the Bible. I'm just going to talk about three of them. The first one, and this is the oldest uh, mention of the word hate that I can find in the Bible was Genesis chapter 4. And then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Spoken directly by God to Cain. Sin is crouching at your door. What sin? Hatred. First, jealousy, because God preferred Abel's offering. His jealousy degenerated into hatred. Even though God had spoken to him, murder was the result. God himself spoke the words to him, and he murdered his brother anyway. Now Cain so it is to, to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel 
and killed him. The second example was about Joseph. It started because of the fancy robe that Jacob had made for Joseph and his brothers were jealous. Here again, jealousy degenerated into hatred. Genesis 37, 4, when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. We're talking about hatred today. Genesis, 30, Genesis 37, 5, Joseph had a dream when he told it to his brothers. They hated him all the more. Their hatred is building up. So Jacob sent Joseph to check on the other 11 sons, and they were watching their father's flocks. In those days, the flocks wandered, and the shepherds wandered with them. So he went to one place and said, where's my brothers? And the guy told him he's over there. So, they, so he went over there. In Genesis 37, starting with 18, but they saw him at a, in a distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. Let's kill our brother. That's real hatred. Causing grief to your own parents because you murdered a sibling. Let's kill the one who is precious to our father. Verse 21, when Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into the cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. So Reuben said that to rescue him from them and to take him back to his father. Good for you, Reuben. He had to speak up against his other brothers when he did that in favor of Joseph, whom they hated. Genesis 37, 25 to 28, as they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. So Joseph's in a hole in the ground, a cistern. They're dug for the purpose of collecting rainwater. They become wells in dry times, but he's down in that hole. And they're sitting down having lunch. They don't care about him being down in that hole. They put him in there and they sat down to eat. And here's a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm and myrrh, and they're on their way to take them down to Egypt. There's some interesting things about this. Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? So he's kind of siding with Reuben here. Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hand on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood, and his brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. Now, this is what's interesting. They saw, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites. Then it says when the Midianites merchants came by, they pulled him out and sold him to the Ishmaelites. Well, the Midianites and the Ishmaelites were not the same people, but they must have been traveling together. The Ishmaelites were descended from Ishmael, a son of Abraham through Hagar the Egyptian. The Midianites were descended from Midian, the son of Abraham, through Keturah. He married Keturah after Sarah died. He married Keturah and they had, they had five sons. And one of them's name was Midian. So here we have the Israelites, sons of Jacob, the Israelites and the Midianites, all cousins, second or third cousins, selling one of their own into slavery in Egypt. Of course, you know the rest of that story that Joseph, you know, gained favor of the Pharaoh and saved the day for the Egyptians and was eventually reunited with his 
family. But fast forward now to Edom. When Moses was leading the Israelites to Canaan, they wanted to go through the land of the Edomites. So the Israelites were in Egypt for 400 years. They grew to a large, uh, to a nation really. And they're on their way to the promised land, the land of Canaan. And they wanted to pass through the land of the Edomites and in Numbers chapter 20, but the Edomites answered, you may not pass through here. If you try, we will march out and attack you with a sword. The Israelites replied, we will go down along the main road. And if we or our livestock drink any of your water, we will pay for it. We only want to pass through on foot, nothing else. Again, they answered, you may not pass through. Then Edom came out against them with a large and powerful army. Since Edom refused to let them go through to their territory, Israel turned away from them. They had to go a roundabout way. The Edomites were descended from Esau, the twin brother of Jacob. <laughs> These things are all interrelated. I think that's fascinating. I never realized that until I started looking into this and researching a little bit. But Edom came from Esau. And they hated the Israelites, even though they were both descended from Abraham and from Isaac. This was a blood feud that lasted for many generations. This all was all about ancient hatred because of the, because of, uh, because uh, Joseph stole Esau's birthright. There was always a contention between them and, they, and Esau became a nation of Edom and, and, and Jacob, whose other name was Israel, became the nation of Israel. So then here's God's response. This was a prophecy in Ezekiel chapter 35 where it says, because you harbored an ancient hostility and delivered the, Ishmaelite, the Israelites over to the sword at the time of their calamity, the time of their punishment reached its climax. Therefore, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I will give you over to bloodshed and it will pursue you since you did not hate bloodshed. Uh, bloodshed will pursue you. He's speaking this to the Edomites. I will make Mount Seir, that was part of their territory, a desolate waste and cut off from it all who come and go. I will fill your mountains with the slain. Those killed by the sword will fall on your hills and in your valleys and in all your ravines. I will make you desolate forever. Your towns will not be inhabited. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Because you have said these two nations and countries will be ours and we will take possession of them, even though the Lord was there. These two countries referring at this particular time in history to Israel and the northern kingdom of uh, northern kingdom of Israel and in Judea. Therefore, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I will treat you in accordance with the anger and jealousy you showed in your hatred. We're talking about hatred today, the hatred of them. And I will make myself known among them when I judge you. Now this is not a response that they wouldn't let Moses come through. This is a response to something else. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have heard all the contemptible things you have said against the mountains of Israel. You said they have been laid waste and have been given over to us to devour. You boasted against me and spoke against me without restraint, and I heard it. This is what our sovereign Lord says. While the whole earth rejoices, I will make you desolate, because you rejoiced when the inheritance of Israel became desolate. That is how I will treat you. You will be desolate, Mount Seir, and you and all of Edom. Then they will know that I am the Lord. Evidently, the Edomites participated with the forces of Nebuchadnezzar when he sacked Jerusalem, killed
killed a bunch of people and took the rest of them captives into Babylon. The Edomites were so hate-filled toward their, and they were, and they were all descended from the same line. They were, they were so hateful toward the Israelites that they even slaughtered children in this, in this battle. Which, which they fought on the side of Nebuchadnezzar. The Edomites thought they could possess then the lands of Judah, which they had always looked on um, in a jealous way. They thought, now that Nebuchadnezzar is against them, we're going we're gonna to help Nebuchadnezzar, and we're going to attack the Israelites, and we will take the land. So who were the Edomites? They were descendants of Esau, Jacob's brother, twin brothers. They should have been able to live in a harmonious brotherhood. But they were in ancient hostility because the original, of the original hostility between Jacob and Esau. And that feud lasted all the way down to the sacking of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar. Nevertheless, all of these different peoples, Edom, Ishmael, Amalek, Moab, Ammon, Philistia, Tyre, and Assyria are among the major players in the Middle East today. These are peoples from whom the jihadists and Islamic fundamentalists come from those people, making up what is known as the Arab or the Muslim world. Today, these people inhabit the nations of Lebanon, Syria, Turkey, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, United Arab Emirates, Jordan, Egypt, Libya, Sudan, and Morocco, Tunisia, etc. And the pseudo nation of Palestine, which is truly Israel. Psalm 83 lists a group of people, a confederacy, whose main enemy is Israel. Today there exists a worldwide jihad against the West, particularly aimed at the great Satan, or the United States, which they call us, and the despised Jews, the state of Israel. The physical descendants of ancient Israel, the English-speaking peoples, the democracies of the Northwest Europe and the Judean diaspora, are the standard bearers of Western civilization. But they hate Western civilization. The West is what they hate. The same players are still in the game. Who has initiated the conflict over these last several years? For the most part, Islamist or fundamentalist Arabs have been the aggressors. The terrorists have mainly come from Saudi Arabia, that's where 9-11, that's where they came from. That's where bin Laden came from. Palestine, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Egypt, North Africa, Iraq, etc. That is the Arab nations. The philosophical or religious underpinnings for these attacks have their source in the virulent anti-Western teachings of Wahhabism, which spread from Saudi Arabia, militant pan-Arab socialism cultivated by despots in Palestine, Syria, Iraq, Egypt, etc., and anti-Semitism, which we are seeing so prominently in these demonstrations today. And these, there's a majority of the Arabs uh, who are themselves, they're Semitic people. They're descendants of Abraham. Does it seem to you that there's no real reason for all of this hostility? The marches against Israel, tearing down of posters, bearing the, depicting the hostages individually with pictures on there, they're, they're, they're tearing those things down. It, it, it's just about hatred college professor claiming to be exhilarated by the attack on October 7th. Exhilarated because babies were beheaded and put into ovens and, and parents were killed and people were burned alive. 
exhilarated because of that. Worldwide protest against Israel. We don't see protest against extremism. Where is the protest against Putin? Do you see any protest against him? Where is the protest against Iran? See any protest against any marching, anybody marching against Iran? Where is the protest against China? Where is the protest against Hamas? I don't, I haven't seen any. We only see extremist protests against anything that comes from God. You can see love in the peaceful rallies. When Israel, when they had the big uh, Jewish rally in Washington, I had an Israeli flag out on my porch. I wanted to support that. But it was a peaceful. It wasn't one of these teeth gnashing, body shaking, chanting. You can see love in the peaceful rallies. The violent demonstrations all over the world seem hateful, angry, and bitter. Hostility against God and God's people has been there from ancient times, and much of it from Abraham's own descendants with hostility against each other. So I preached about bitterness maybe two weeks ago. Now we're talking about hatred. Violence comes from hatred. Assault, murder, vicious barbarism, like that on October 7th in Israel, all come from hate. One person wants another destroyed, not in love or in peace, but in hate. Hatred is a powerful emotion. Hate has been among the human race since the fall of man in Eden. We see hate all through the Bible. We see hate all through recorded history. They hated Jesus. They killed him in the most cruel possible way. They hated him. He was a threat to them, to their status quo. You are hated. That's right. I said, you are hated. Satan hates you. Satan accuses you. Satan wants you dead. And he wants you in hell. What you, when you're doing your best to live for God and things seem to go wrong, sometimes that's an attack of the enemy. And we have to realize it and take authority over it. Put Satan in his place. Get thee behind me. And Pentecostal people are binding Satan. Satan, we bind you. Well, if you can bind him, why is he out? You can't bind Satan. That's the, God's going to bind him and chain him up and throw him in a pit one day. But people say, Satan, we bind you. And there's been thousands of people binding Satan every day. Well, why isn't he bound then? We can't bind Satan. You can bind the effects of what he does, but you can't bind him. God's going to do that. We're not that handy. We're not that powerful. Romans 12, 12, here's what we should do. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction. That's a hard one. Faithful in prayer. James 1, 2, and 2 to 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete not lacking anything. The enemy, because he hates you, causes trials, causes affliction, tries to derail your walk with God. So Satan is the master hater. But God is on our side. He's the master lover. And he's on our side. The world hates us. He loves us. Satan is the hateful God of this world, but God is the loving God of every believer. We can utterly depend on his love no matter what. 
1 John 4, 7 and 12, dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his long love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Romans 12, 9 to 13, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. We're allowed to hate one thing, evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. Serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Remember, God's love is with us so powerfully that we win. God wins. We're just hanging on to his coattails. Satan's hatred is no match for the powerful love of our great God. Hatred is around you, but love is in you. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. So we need to practice love. That's how we overcome hatred. First of all, love God. Pray to him. Commune with God in your prayer life. Speak to him and give him time to speak to you. Secondly, love those around you. Pray for them. The best thing you can do for those that you care about is to pray for them. Number three, love those who hate you. That's a hard one. Pray for them. It takes practice to love those that hate you because our natural reaction is to hate them back, to growl and make a long face. Well, that's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to love those who hate us. Win them over. That's the hardest one. Luke 6, 27 and 26, or 20, 28. But, you, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. So the way to, get, the way to conquer hatred is with love. That's our weapon. Hate is a weapon of the enemy. Love is our weapon, and we have to be practicing it, and that's how we overcome hatred. Otherwise, hatred has no opposition. Our love is the opposition. Amen? Would you stand? And right after we dismiss, I need to have a word with, the, with those who attend on Wednesday nights. Dear Lord, we thank you this morning that we've had an opportunity to get together, to praise and worship you, to share our testimonies, honoring you, and to hear from your word. It's been a good day, Lord. Bless the rest of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I need to see anybody uh, that attends on Wednesday.